we have Dr. Greg Marshall, a profession chair of the Department of Respiratory Care in Texas, State Sleep Center Director. Dr. Marshall, would you like to share a few words with the audience today? Sure, it's a real privilege to be able to speak to you all about the unsung heroes, uh, respiratory therapists that uh, like you heard, uh, when there was talk about ventilators, you can ask every physician and nurse in ICU, if there's a ventilator, there's a respiratory therapist, uh, because they're the ones that manage and adjust and uh, help to recuperate our patients that are in critical care uh, that we've especially seen during this, this time of COVID. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to three of our graduates uh, from our program that are on the, uh, the call today, Jenna and Isabel and Jessica. It's great to see our grads out there making waves and uh, opening doors. Uh, we just think, uh, I'm, they, they can tell you, I'm crazy about respiratory therapy. Uh, I've been involved with the university in education for many years, and it's been a real privilege to see uh, young men and women uh, get the skills that they need to take off and to be outstanding therapists in our area. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Marshall. Uh, next, uh, like Dr. Marshall said, one of his graduates, we have Isabel on the call today. Uh, she's a respiratory therapist with St. David's Healthcare. Isabel, would you like to share a few words? Hi, um, nice to meet all of you. Like Dr. Marshall said, um, I just graduated actually in May 2019 with my bachelor's degree. Um, and I've been working as a respiratory therapist here in Austin at St. David's Medical Center um, since that summer. Um, definitely been interesting um, getting into the field for the first time with a global pandemic going on. So, <laughs> um, but I really, really enjoy my job. And I actually um, just graduated this past December with my master's in respiratory care from Texas State as well. So eat them up, go Bobcat. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Isabel. Uh, next, we have Joshua. He's from help. He's from Region 13, a health science instructor. Joshua, would you like to say a few words? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, I do want to preface: I respiratory therapists are awesome. I am not a respiratory therapist. I am a teacher. <laughs> uh, my background is actually in athletic training and sports medicine, but. I am a, a program manager at Region 13, and, and one of my big tasks right now is working with rural district, districts to expand their CTE uh, education. And uh, today I'm going to be leading you through just a, a short activity that uh, if you are in the classroom, you could potentially do with your students. Or if you need a good uh, something to talk about at a party, maybe you could do this at a party too. So thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Thank you for joining us, Joshua. And we have Anna, uh, Clinical Education Coordinator with Ascension. Anna, would you like to say a few words? Uh, yeah, just thanks for having me and happy to be here. I love talking about respiratory therapists. Most people don't know um, who we are and what we do in the hospital. So um, it's always fun to tell people because we really go everywhere all day and it's always surprising to people. So I love, I love sharing that. Perfect, thank you. And last but not least, we have Jenna, Director of Respiratory Care with Concordia University. Um, Jenna, would you like to say a few words? Hi, uh, yes, thank you, Shannon. Um, well, thank you for having me and having all of us to talk about respiratory therapy, which is something all of us are obviously very, very passionate about. And like Dr. Marshall said, I am a previous Texas State grad. Absolutely, go Bobcats. And uh, very, you know, very proud to be so. Um, and um, it's, you know, I've, I've come a long way since I've graduated at Texas State University um, as a respiratory therapist. And really, I found my vocation in education. So I have continued to, uh, to educate in every possible place that I can and have been a program director um, at a previous school and then now at Concordia University, Texas, um, building uh, two brand new uh, bachelor's programs in respiratory care. And um, actually I have uh, Dr. Marshall and Miss Anna Kale to thank for 
a lot of the success that I have had up to this point. Um, and I say that because as a respiratory therapist, it's all about teamwork and that's what you need to be successful. And so you can't do it without your team. So I'm very grateful for all of those who have helped me get this far in my career. Thank you so much for sharing, Jenna. All right, now that you guys have met our panelists, um, we're gonna move on to what can we expect during this uh, presentation today? So we went through our welcome and introductions. We went through our panelist introductions. We're gonna um, give you guys a little bit of labor market information within the respiratory therapy field. And then after we're gonna have, we have a questionnaire for our panelists. And then as Joshua mentioned, he's gonna be putting on a um, hands-on activity for us after the questionnaire has been completed. We'll have a Q&A session and Ashley will bring us some spring updates and then we will close out the presentation. All right, so just um, a little labor market information. If you are someone who's in a crowd looking to begin a career in RT, uh, the, what the picture on the screen here is the top employers who are hiring for RT in the Austin metro area. Um, so as we can see at the top, Ascension Health is one of our top employers who are hiring for RTs right now. And I'll just give you guys a few minutes to just look um, over this chart so you can see which employers are hiring the most and which ones are not hiring uh, that much at the moment. And in addition to the labor market information, also wanted to share some salary um, ranges with you guys as well. So as you can see on my screen here, medium salary for RTs is at 60,000. Um, and then we also have job postings in the last 12 months was at 460. So at the moment, RT is very much so in demand, uh, especially with everything that's happening right now. So very thankful for everyone who's in the field right now. Um, and, you know, just putting in the work for us. Um, and then we also have, on the other side, we have a graph that shows respiratory therapists and it shows um, similar jobs, but not so similar in the field of RT. So if you're someone who's interested in getting into the healthcare field and you could be thinking about RT, around this graph here shows other jobs in the healthcare field that you can also try exploring along the realms of RT as well. Okay. And we also see a very high projected growth right here. All right. And then um, I want to introduce to you guys, if you have it, or if you don't know this already, at Workforce Solutions Capital Area, respiratory therapist is actually one of our programs that we do fund for. Um, so here on the screen, you see our, our ladder here. And what the latter pretty much says or details is that you can start as a respiratory um, therapy technician and then you can move all the way up the ladder to a respiratory therapist. So um, having your associate's degree will get you in the field of being a technician, but obviously continuing your education can move you up to the field of being a RT. Um, and as I mentioned, um, at Workforce Solutions Capital Area, we do provide uh, funding for that. Um, and if you guys do want more information on that, I'll, my contact information is at the end of this uh, presentation as well. All right, so let's get into the questions for our panelists here. So for everyone sitting on our panel, could you briefly speak on your educational background and your job experiences that led to where you are now? And I'll go in order in which I see on my screen. So Dr. Marshall, would you like to go first? I, I've always been interested in healthcare and medicine, just didn't know exactly where I would land. I had the opportunity to work in a hospital when I was a, a teenager and really kind of float around to the different areas, physical therapy, respiratory therapy, nursing, uh, radiation, uh, all the different areas and, and had a great opportunity to kind of see what they were about. The thing that I loved about respiratory therapy was that it was fast paced, fast moving. You had to think quickly on your feet 
you were all over the hospital. You were in the ER, you were in the ICU, you were on the medical surgical floor, and you had many situations where you needed to step in and intervene uh, when people's breathing uh, became a problem. I also like the fact that the patient population group is everything from the newborn, the neonate, to infants, to pediatrics, young adults, adults and the elderly. So you had a, a broad experience with all different age groups and I really enjoyed that. Uh, most of all, I guess I just love not being stuck in one place and I love to be able to, uh, to bounce around the hospital if there was something exciting that was going on the respiratory therapists were there. So uh, I asked the respiratory therapist in this hospital, where do you recommend that I go to get a respiratory education? And even back then, when dinosaurs were babies, uh, they told me it was at uh, Texas State University, uh, then called Southwest Texas State University. And so I attended uh, the very program that I'm a chair for now. Uh, so I have a long history and a great appreciation for uh, this university's uh, support of respiratory therapy. Uh, it is an incredible field that you can take to whatever lengths that you want. You can veer into education, uh, like Jenna was talking, you can go into research, you can go into clinical specialties for adults and for pediatrics, you can go into sleep. We just don't have the burnout uh, that many health professions have because we get trained as generalists in all those areas. And you can pull out of an area and reinvent yourself in another area. And I just don't know another field that's quite like it. Uh, so besides being in ICU, there's a lot of things that we do besides that. And in uh, patient health and, and disease management and education, uh, it's a, uh, it's, you'll never make a mistake to, to be in respiratory therapy. If you like fast paced, fast moving, uh, quick thinking on your feet, we get to do a lot of that. Thanks. Yeah, um, so I went to respiratory school in Wisconsin. That's where I'm from. I moved to Austin like in 2009, so I've been here for a while, but um, big Packer fan, go Packers. Uh, so in my area of the country, the majority of the respiratory schools are actually two year programs, um, or at least they were at the time. Um, so I went to a technical college for school and um, I graduated with my associate's degree in respiratory care, um, which made me eligible to take our um, national credentialing exams. Um, and I passed those, so I achieved the credential of first certified respiratory therapist and then registered respiratory therapist. And so I was able to work, um, you know, side by side with all the other respiratory therapists. Then I moved to Austin and it was interesting to me because everybody here, because of Texas State um, being so close, has mostly a bachelor's degree. Um, now, I did go back to school to achieve my bachelor's degree. That's because for a short time I went into healthcare academia and was a director of clinical education for a respiratory program. And so you need those advanced degrees um, on, under your belt in order to um, be allowed to participate and be a part of a respiratory program where you're teaching um, the you know, next coming generation of the profession. Um, so I have a rest, uh, bachelor's in um, interdisciplinary studies with a focus on respiratory care and organizational management from uh, St. Edwards in Austin. So. Thank you for sharing, Anna. Yeah. Um, Isabel, I have you next. Uh, would you like to share? Sure. So I kind of briefly touched on my education background earlier, um, but I, so I, out of high school went to, I'm from Austin originally, so um, went to Texas State for college and like Dr. Marshall knew I wanted to do something in the medical field, had always had a passion for healthcare, but wasn't really sure um, what exactly I wanted to do. Um, originally started as a nursing major, began my prerequisites with uh, microbiology, anatomy and physiology, and just absolutely loved the sciences, 
but the more I went through college, the more I was like, well, I don't know. The nursing professionist for me had the opportunity to speak with my um, advisor on campus and they um, suggested I take Dr. Marshall's class actually for intro to respiratory care um, and absolutely fell in love with the profession. Um, listening to Dr. Marshall um, just and how passionate he was about the profession and really, really grew my interest and I was hooked. So I applied to Texas State's program for that following fall and was accepted into the program. And so um, kind of similar to Anna's experience, it is a two year program, but you need um, two years of prerequisites also. So four years total for your bachelor's degree. Um, in the program, I was introduced also to the master's program that Texas State offered for respiratory care and um, decided to go that route as well. Um, I absolutely love working at the bedside, but I want to teach eventually and join the academia world. And so in order to do that, I need a master's degree under my belt. Um, I chose a concentration in polysomography, which is um, the study of sleep. Um, <laughs> Dr. Marshall's excited about that. Um, so am I. Um, but yeah, right now I, same like Anna, since it's a national um, credentialing exam that you take for to become a respiratory therapist, I took, um, after I graduated with my bachelor's, I was eligible to sit for the CRT, um, credentialed respiratory therapist, passed that exam, and then was eligible, therefore, to sit for the second exam. So now I'm a registered respiratory therapist and began practicing immediately after graduation. I think I graduated in May and was employed by the end of July. So um, this was pre-pandemic too. So this was, um, respiratory has always been a very, very high demand job. No matter where you go in the country, um, you're guaranteed to find a job somewhere. Um, we are always going to be needed. And that's another thing that really drew me to the profession as well. Just job security and, um, but then also getting to work with patients and be there for someone in their really dark times in their life and um, be able to help them through it. And I, before talking with my advisor in college, I really didn't know that much about respiratory therapy. I think it's um, not as well known as some of the other medical professions, but learning more about the profession and then now working in the hospital as a respiratory therapist you are needed everywhere in every department, um, whether because I work both ER, ICU, in the NICU with the preemie babies. Um, we are on the floors with other acute patients. Um, you are truly needed everywhere. And your nurses all the time constantly are like, I don't know what I would do without my respiratory therapist. You are my right hand man, my go to person. Um, and I'm really just love that aspect of teamwork and everybody in the hospital works together for better of the patient and better plan of care for everyone. And I'm really excited to pursue my uh, career further with my master's degree now under my belt recently. So um, definitely a field to highly recommend to anyone wanting to join the medical field. Thank you, Isabel. All right, uh, Jenna, would you like to share with us? Sure. So my uh, educational background, um, kind of where I started in respiratory care or rather healthcare, um, I was, uh, it started in high school. I was the president of my HOSA chapter in high school. And that's when I knew that I was very interested and had a passion in healthcare. And so after that, I, uh, after I graduated from high school, I became um, a Bobcat, went to, it was, it was actually Southwest when I started and then transitioned to Texas State um, during my time there. And um, I had initially been a pre-PT major. 
And while I was taking those introductory classes and, um, and I love all my physical therapist friends. So, um, very, very much. And they're just, they are a part of the team and we couldn't do without them. But as I was taking those initial courses, um, I needed something, uh, like Dr. Marshall had mentioned something more fast paced. I needed, you know, a little bit or a lot of the adrenaline and the satisfaction that I could get from patient care in so many different ways that respiratory could offer me um, at the bedside um, than any other of the healthcare professions that um, I had researched and you know come in contact with. So I decided to um, change my major to respiratory therapy, uh, not to mention I have a, um, it's very close to my heart in, in many ways in my family um, struggles with a lot of chronic respiratory disorders and I have been taking care of a lot of family members with these issues for a very long time. And so with this, education with with the background that I have and then the education I was pursuing not only was I pursuing a goal and something I felt passionate about but also to you know where I can turn around and not just help patients but educate my family and help them as well and I have done that ever since the first year I have enrolled in a the respiratory program um, I graduated my bachelor's of science degree from Texas State University, and I went on to work at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar, but um, you know, it was the biggest and the baddest, and that's where I wanted to do my internship, and that's where I started working afterwards. I worked in, you know, all of the units, uh, you know, from the neonatal ICU to adult trauma to the uh, burn intensive care and got a lot of experience there before I missed Austin way too much and I and I moved back and I moved back here uh, where I started working um, for Ascension and through Ascension I had several different roles and moving from a you know a staff therapist throughout all of the units in the hospital to a charge therapist and also being able to have the opportunity uh, to begin a special very special uh, program and uh, kind of like my baby before I left uh, before I left Ascension was the ECMO and critical care transport team. So I played a part in forming that team and you know that was very educational in itself. And during that time of being a respiratory therapist, being a preceptor for other RTs, taking students, realizing that education is where I, and, and educating patients, that's where I, um, I really thrived. And so I, you know, kind of figured out that education is where I wanted to go with my respiratory care degree. And so I went on to uh, work as a director of clinical education for a respiratory care program. And um, I earned my uh, master's, uh, my MBA, Master's of Business Administration from New England College. And I did that to help with, um, as I wanted to grow into a program director and a lot of the different things that you need under your belt as a program director to run a, a program of any kind. Um, you know, being a manager, being a leader, learning a lot of those, um, those, you know, those, those skills that are not innate, but the ones that such as when I had to sit at a round table and talk about budget where I'd never had to do that before, but I had to run a program successfully and make sure that my students were successful, make sure that my faculty were successful, that the curriculum and everything else was um, not just to par, but you know above and beyond. And so I, kept going and, you know, achieved my master's degree. And in that time, uh, have 
been a program director knowing that this is, you know, what I would like to do. And I can't express enough how important education is and lifelong learning and respiratory care because healthcare is forever evolving and there is not a single day that has gone by that I have not learned something and tried to learn something. So that's my background. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jenna. Thank you, everyone um, who answered that question. Um, okay. And here are some pictures that Dr. Marshall uh, graciously shared with us. Um, I don't know, Dr. Marshall, if you just want to give like a little snippet of what we're seeing here on the screen. Sure. Uh, what I wanted to be able to capture here was just, um, I guess, the diversity of the different areas where the respiratory skill is utilized. Everything from a little child that you see in the upper left hand side that's taking uh, nebulizer treatment, uh, probably for asthma, uh, to a, a crew that is around a, an adult ventilator getting ready to take it into the unit. Uh, and then next you see on the top right, pulmonary function testing, which is diagnostic. So there's a there is a Monday through Friday, eight to five, very sane part of our profession. Uh, there's no emergency calls or stat pulmonary function tests that are done. So that's another area that people can uh, take a look at. Uh, and what's happening there, they're uh, actually measuring the lung function, uh, which is needed to provide a diagnosis for any kind of lung disorder. Uh, down below that, you see an EKG or an ECG that's being ready to uh, be administered there. Uh, and then in the middle on the bottom, uh, again, we see a patient scenario where there's a respiratory therapist uh, at the bedside controlling and managing the ventilator. There's one that's drawing arterial blood gases. Uh, there's another that's bagging uh, the individual as well. And, and then again, a, a, an adult situation on the lower left, uh, a breathing treatment for someone who has asthma, perhaps. Uh, so just kind of a, a visual of all the different areas that you can become involved in, in the hospital. And, and like Isabel and Jenna have said, it's very fast paced. We are kind of uh, adrenaline junkies. We love it. <laughs> we love to run down the hall to the emergencies because we know that when we open the door, we're gonna be having to think on our feet and we're gonna to have to quickly assess what's going on. And there's such an incredible gratification in knowing as you drive away from the hospital, many, many times you know that if you hadn't been there today, someone's outcome may have been very different. And we really get to see lives saved just because of our involvement. Uh, and that's what really energizes us in many ways. And, and we can hardly wait to come back for the next day. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. All right, so um, to save on time here, I'm gonna ask this question to Anna and Isabel. So what would you say are the top three skills needed to be successful as a respiratory therapist? Um, I, I'll go first. I would say um, <clears throat> the ability to adapt quickly and be okay with change. Um, because just like, you know, we've been mentioning that our uh, work is so fast paced, it can also change, like, part of the fast pacedness is the ability for what you're doing or the plan that you might have for your day to just change just like that. So, you know, when we get to work, we have an assignment sheet and we kind of have an idea of all of the um, treatments and the workload that we have to give for the day. But as I'm going throughout that assignment and I'm going from patient room to patient room, you know, a trauma could get called and I have to run to the emergency room. Um, a baby could be in the middle of being born and I got to run to the C-section room. Um, they could have a code in the OR and need me to set up a specialty gas and I have to run and do that. Um, and all that other work that was scheduled at the beginning of my shift, that work doesn't go away. So not only do I have to respond to those emergencies and be able to, you know, manipulate very quickly and pivot that way, I also have to make sure I get that stuff done and then get right back to those patients who are still there and need my help throughout the day. So 
that's one thing. Um, that was kind of a big one. Um, you know, compassion for people is really important. Um, we have no idea the circumstances that bring people into the hospital. And truly those things are kind of none of our business. We just need to take care of all of the patients the best that we can, um, treat them all the same and have compassion and help them in their situation. Um, and one last thing, I don't know, I'll, I'll punt it to you, Isabel, for some, some other attribute we need. I think you did a really good job of nailing that one on the head. Um, and a couple others that I thought of were uh, ability to multitask. That kind of goes along with ability to adapt as well. Um, we are expected to do several different tasks during our shift at the hospital, um, whether it's draw uh, arterial blood gases, run those arterial blood gases in the um, analyzer machine, um, help with an intubation of a patient and placing them on the ventilator and then further uh, managing that ventilator throughout the rest of our shift while also seeing our other patients on the floor and giving them their nebulizer treatments on time or their um, different therapies that we deliver and all while being split throughout the hospital and um, going to C-sections and like Anna talked about. Um, so the ability to multitask and do um, a couple different things at one time while you're getting all your intubation supplies, but also making sure your ventilator is set up and ready to go for when the patient's ready to go on after the procedure's done. Um, and then another one would be to work under pressure. Um, we are adrenal adrenaline junkies and like that fast paced um, work environment. And a lot of times um, we are there or every single time a patient codes and or goes into cardiac arrest, we're gonna be at the bedside um, assisting the rest of the team and in resuscitating this patient. And that's a very stressful um, scenario to be in. And the ability to hold your composure and think on the spot and get what needs to be done done to save this patient's life. Um, and then, oh, I just had another one that I thought was a good, um, kind of along the same lines of working under pressure and multitasking and ability to adapt, but then also, like Anna said, being compassionate and having empathy for people and being patient um, with our patients because they're sick and we sometimes, they're grumpy because they don't feel good and we get the brood of it all, but just being able to understand that they're in a tough place in their life and need us to be the kind soul and the smile that they see and can help brighten their day as well, even if they really are not having the greatest week of their life. But just being able to share um, just our kindness with them also while multitasking and working under pressure and adapting to all the changes that are thrown our way through our shift. Thank you, Anna and Isabel. Oh, if, right. I could, if I could add one thing about that, I always uh, like to tell uh, people about respiratory therapists is that we are kind of the eyes of the hospital in, in a way. And so you've got to be ready to just anticipate too when patients are starting to um, digress and, are, and they're starting to get worse. And so we're really good about recognizing those uh, type of patients and bringing them uh, their level of importance a little bit higher so that you know, nurses can kind of uh, jump in there also and do what they need to do. So I love that part. So just being able to recognize when those patients uh, do need our help before it gets to the extreme level where we're pushing that patient to the ICU. That's a really good point, Jessica. I always like to, when I tell people that same thing, I always describe it as like, you know, you have this um, scale of sickness that a patient could be on where they're near death or about to, you know, be discharged and walk outside the door. And a respiratory therapist sees those patients along the entire spectrum 
Whereas um, a nurse, maybe their critical care nurse, they go and they see the patients only in this section when they're really, really, really sick. And a general medical floor nurse only sees the patients when they're not really, really sick. So the respiratory therapist, that's the perfect way to put it is, you know, the eyes of the hospital because we can see when, you know, there's a patient in critical care who maybe they're actually getting better or a patient who is on the general medical floor where they're actually getting worse. So I think that we're a real value to the whole medical team in that regard because we're one of the few disciplines that's really going throughout that whole spectrum of acuity. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Anna. Um, all right, moving on to question number three. I'm going to ask this one to Isabel. Uh, could you describe a challenging experience you had with the patient? How did you handle it and what did you learn? Well, I feel like every day I go to the hospital and I um, experience a challenge with a patient. Um, I guess uh, one of the overall slightly more more common situations would be um, during a code. So when someone goes into cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest in the hospital, they'll call it overhead throughout the whole hospital, um, code blue room 243 or code blue ICU bed 15 or wherever it might be in the hospital. Um, and as a respiratory therapist, we respond to all of those. And so having my whole day planned out, kind of like Anna talked about being able to adapt, I have my whole day planned. Okay, I'm going to see these patients at this time, these ones after lunch, these ones between 3 and 4 p.m., yada, yada. And then this code happens and you're like, oh, shoot, okay, drop everything, got to go there now. So having to, one, rearrange my plan that I had for my day, but then also you arrive to the code and carrying out your task there is can be very challenging, um, especially um, like out on just your general hospital floors. Typically the rooms are a lot smaller. There's a lot of people that arrive to this scene to respond to help. Um, and so just having to um, work with everybody um, to uh, have a good patient outcome and um, resuscitate this patient. So as a respiratory therapist, your job is airway management. So as soon as I walk in the room, I'm going to assess what's going on and hopefully someone's already on the chest doing compressions. Hopefully they've already rolled the crash cart into the room to set up the defibrillator pads to shock the patient. Um, and as a respiratory therapist, my eyes always go to the head of the bed. Okay, is someone up there with the bag and mask giving this person the breath that they can't take right now? And so that's where I'm going to go is I'm going to make sure I have my bag, I have the mask, and I get up there immediately and start being this person's airway until we can uh, put a tube down their throat to establish one. And um, it can be very challenging and scary still and I've um because it's someone's life that you're dealing with and it's um in very intense but then um we can stabilize them and get them to the ICU where they can have more critical uh care whether it's different IVs that need to put in need to be put in different medications that this patient needs to be on in order to get past their um illness for the time being and um, I think the most important thing in situations like that is just to stay calm and act as a team player. Um, my main job is airway management, but if I'm already in the room and someone's up there already, um, being this person's airway, then stepping in somewhere else to help with what's going on, whether that's running and getting supplies that someone needs or um, doing chest compressions myself or getting stuff out of the room, out of the way so that everyone else can have um, space to work. Um, so I think being a team player, staying calm, and then also um, just being quick, critical thinking is very important in situations like that. And then those challenging 
um, scenarios. Um, and I feel like every single time I walk out of a code, I learn something new, whether it's, okay, I could have done this better. I could have, um, been a little bit quicker to do this, or as a team, we could have communicated better, but then also I feel like my critical thinking improves every time I leave a code and my, um, ability to, uh, clinically assess what's going on improves every time I leave the room. And I don't know, I just feel like at the hospital, I really do learn something new every day about myself and about healthcare and about um, the human body, because it's just absolutely fascinating. And healthcare is constantly evolving and there's always, always something new to learn. Thank you, Isabel. Okay. All right, so for Dr. Marshall and Jenna, how has your job responsibilities changed since COVID-19? Well, that's a, that's a, a great question. I, I'll tell you um, one thing that's happened that all of us as respiratory therapists are very grateful for is uh, the spotlight has finally shone on us a little bit. And we, you know, I always watch the medical shows to see if they put a respiratory therapist on the cast and they never do. It's always nurses and doctors. They leave us out, but that's okay. We, we are kind of the silent heroes, but uh, COVID-19 has definitely highlighted uh, the role of respiratory therapist. Uh, you know, we, we got to hear even, you know, government administration saying the words respiratory therapist and associating us with ventilators. Uh, and that was great. I mean, that's not all we do, but that was a, that was a great start. Uh, I'll tell you how it's affected uh, my department in Texas State is that uh, in the spring when everything was breaking, uh, hospitals began to contact us to ask if they could borrow ventilators from our uh, ventilator lab. And we were happy to do that. And so we, we rearranged the curriculum so that it didn't impact it. And we were able to lend out 14 ventilators to area uh, hospitals uh, in Austin. And we were so happy to be part of that. We also were able to donate PPE uh, that was so needed uh, before we had good avenues to receive those. Uh, it's definitely caused uh, interest. Uh, it's, uh, it's caused our current students who are in respiratory care to value, to see the value that they bring even, even greater. Uh, and I think the other thing that, that kind of goes along with the discussion that's been happening about uh, what's an important attribute as well, in, and that's the ability to work in a team. And that's something that we really stress while they're in school, but it's only when they're in the hospital do they really get to learn how to work with physicians and nurses uh, and other therapists in a team approach uh, because so much can be accomplished with that. That's the ideal situation where everyone is giving their expertise and input and bringing their past experiences uh, to, to that situation. So respiratory therapists, we're needed out there. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Jenna, uh, would you like to add anything to this question? Sure. Um, you know, just uh, to kind of piggyback off of what Dr. Marshall said in regards to, you know, job responsibilities as a respiratory therapist during COVID-19. Um, and, you know, similarly, that RTs are 100% the whether they are unsung or, you know, shouted from the rooftop heroes of COVID-19 and the success um, that we have had thus far. And I know it may not seem, um, you know, very positive given everything that has been happening these last few months and everything that the entire country and the world has been experiencing um, and what people um, in the hospital, what, you know, what they see in comparison to what everyone else sees like on the media per se. But I will say that RTs have been able to save so many lives when it has come to COVID and this could not have been done and the patient's lives could not have been saved 
um, and the education could not have been given um, and provided to the other healthcare professionals for this respiratory issue had it not been for respiratory therapists. This is our specialty. This is what we go to school for. This is what we manage is mechanical ventilation, airway, and everything to do with cardiopulmonary disease. And here we are in a respiratory pandemic. And now more than ever, do we need the respiratory therapist. So as before, we, um, I think I saw on Gray's Anatomy once where they called for the RT to get a CPAP or an I, you know, incentive spirometer or something like that <laughs> once. And I was actually, you know, very excited that we were, um, you know, even brought up. And it was, it just so happens on another show just this last week they were they the patient crashed and they were doing compressions on their chest and they said call respiratory get respiratory in here now and the difference between gray's anatomy five years ago and now is i think the profession is really being brought to light and so the changes and the responsibilities of the rt at the bedside and um, you know, I have a family of RTs, believe it or not. My husband is an RT and he works at all of the Ascension Seton uh, hospitals throughout our entire area, travels to all of them and works in the COVID unit almost every single shift. Um, and his job has changed exponentially and it's changed my job not only um, as a as an educator because I'm having to work from home um, to stay safe and to keep others safe, but everything has changed as far as you know um, everybody's personal life, and we need to think about that as well, not just for RTs but for healthcare providers, and you know the toll that it has taken on you know, the isolation and um, the schooling, having to have a full-time job and also homeschool your, your child and keep everybody safe and keep, you know, wiping everything down and washing your hands and wearing masks. And um, I mean, having to adapt. And as an, as an RT, that's what we do, we adapt. And so in this situation, since we're so used to having to adapt and it has been difficult and we are short staffed. So hence we're highlighting our profession because of this pandemic has brought to light how important respiratory therapists are to the healthcare community, even before COVID. And now that we realize that, now that we know that for a fact and everybody who's not an RT knows that, we hope to bring more RTs into the fold and um, I look forward to all of the new students that are going to be graduating soon and you know, joining, joining the respiratory therapy team. Thank you, Jenna um, and Dr. Marshall. All right, here's uh, more pictures um, that Dr. Marshall shared with us. Dr. Marshall, I'm not sure if you wanna give us a little detail of what we see here. Sure, top, top left, another pulmonary function testing uh, opportunity. In the middle, on the top, you see assessment uh, that's going on for an outpatient there. Uh, top right, uh, NEP treatment for a young man that uh, has some asthma. Down below is uh, uh, one of our faculty, Dr. Joshua Gonzalez, uh, in a lab teaching uh, our students uh, about uh, with a mannequin that is intubated and on a ventilator and assessment. Uh, then in the middle on the bottom, you see someone with nasal CPAP uh, that's uh, learning about uh, support for nighttime uh, CPAP. And uh, then a wonderful picture on the lower left, this is the goal. So graduation uh, of a bachelor's degree class there as they're ready to walk across the stage. And uh, that's absolutely uh, uh, Jenna's goal, my goal, all educators, we wanna see more respiratory therapists out there and we're so proud of all of them. I want to add one thing, Dr. Marshall. Is um, is this the class that went to Guyana? 
this is. Okay, I recognized a lot of them as I was looking at that picture. And so um, one thing, and, and, I, and the reason I bring this up is that RTs are, you know, we can work anywhere um, and not only in the United States. And so these students um, had an opportunity to uh, travel to Guyana in South America, and I had the honor of going with them, and we were able to um, go to, you know, this area that has, I mean, the the quality of care, but they they do the best they can with what they have. And that is what is important. And while we were there, we were working in the hospitals with physicians, with nurses. We were teaching physician and nurses how to use ventilators, how to ventilate a patient. Um, you know, in their hospitals, we went to orphanages and clinics and did diagnostic testing um, on all of these patients. And you know, taught students went to um, went to junior highs and high school to teach about respiratory education, um, you know, the, the dangers of, you know, smoking and, you know, and vaping. And I mean, they, and they, everybody there was, you know, with open arms, they just welcomed us with open arms and wished that we would have never left. And it was one of the most um, amazing experiences I've ever had. And, you know, I really encourage anyone that goes into the respiratory care field to not stay put, to really, you know, go out there and explore and especially, you know, something like this, studying abroad and bringing respiratory care education um, and, you know, knowledge of the profession um, throughout different areas, you know, throughout the world. And so this class right here in this picture, um, those students, uh, we spent every waking moment for two weeks together in um, in South America in the rainforest, on a little boat going down the Amazon River, just to be able to provide diagnostic testing to you know some of the people um, in in this area, and it was it was absolutely incredible. So just another opportunity for RTs. Thank you for that story, uh, Jenna. Um, so this next question is actually going to be for you, Jenna. Could you briefly explain to us the education requirements it takes to become an RT? Sure. So after after you um, finish, you know, after your uh, after you're finished with high school, um, the minimum requirement is. And is, um, is currently an associate degree in respiratory care, which is a two year degree. And there are so many amazing RTs out there that have started their career with an associate degree in respiratory care. Um, now, with healthcare always, always evolving, um, and it always will. All of the professions in healthcare, we, we have to, we have to keep up, keep up with the times as uh, the profession of respiratory care grows and it evolves, so do our responsibilities. And that means we need more education, the lifelong learning that I had mentioned earlier. And so we need to take classes that are not just technical courses, right? I mean, we have to know how to intubate patients, you know, put that breathing tube down. We have to know how to ventilate them and how to manage the ventilator and theory um, and practice and application in, you know, in the lab and in the clinical setting. But also the course that we also need a very strong background in a lot of other different um, in, a, in a lot of other different courses and competencies, such as leadership and management, um, not to mention all of the, you know, general education courses, such as, um, for instance, anatomy and physiology, you know, microbiology, chemistry, physics, 
um, algebra. These are all things that are very important you know, to become a respiratory therapist, but what a bachelor's degree, and that is where the profession is going. We are shifting toward a, a minimum of a bachelor degree requirement. And what, what our professional organization, the AARC, has really been pushing for and, you know, um, you know advocating is for all respiratory therapists, um, you know, in 2025 to 2030 that enter the field will need a bachelor's degree to practice respiratory therapy. And I think that's very important to understand, especially for those that are interested in the field now, um, earning that bachelor's degree can give you that background in you know, interprofessional communication and, and like I mentioned, leadership and research and you know, so many other different um, subjects that are very important in addition to all of the respiratory care courses um, and also a if you know if you want to continue and go into different areas of respiratory care such as education for example if you'd like to teach at the bachelor's level you know you it will require a master's degree um, if you would like to become a manager or a director or um, an edu you know some educators at different hospitals um, you know those require bachelor's degrees or master's degrees um, I mean, I have friends that are respiratory therapists that are also CEOs of their own companies and, you know, require higher degrees. So what is required at the moment, you know, is an associate's degree in respiratory care, but where the profession is going is it will be, you know, a minimum of a bachelor's degree. And those that have an associate's degree, there are so many opportunities out there to, um, continue that lifelong learning, continue that degree and finish their, their bachelor's in, in respiratory care um, in an online format so they can continue to do the amazing things they do every day, not quit their job, continue working um, and finish the coursework that they, that they need to, to be all that they can be and to pursue all of their goals and um, excel in their career. Thank you, Jenna, um, for that answer. Um, and thank you all for um, sticking around with us. We have two more questions, and then we're going to be moving over to Joshua's hands-on um, activity. All right, so I'm going to ask this question to Dr. Marshall. Um, what can high school students do now to prepare for a career as a respiratory therapist? Well, that's a great question. We used to be able to. Um, let interested students shadow a therapist in, uh, in the hospital and things have changed and that's not uh, uh, available anymore. Uh, uh, I believe it was Anna that mentioned that she was involved in a HOSA program. Uh, HOSA is a health occupation uh, program that's in some high schools that if you have a HOSA program uh, in your high school, you can certainly uh, take that opportunity to look at all the health professions and respiratory is certainly one of those. We've had several students that came from HOSA programs in high school and they walked right in the door understanding what respiratory was about and were excited to be there. That's another opportunity. And then I would suggest uh, finding a respiratory therapist and talking with them. Uh, really like what we're doing now. I mean, what, what you see behind you is our beautiful Willow Hall on Round Rock campus, uh, Texas State University. Uh, we would love for you to come for a visit and walk through the building and take a look at the labs, talk with the faculty. I would encourage you to, to speak with, with Jenna and different individuals who uh, have uh, education and academics as part of their, their job now. And then active therapists like Isabel, um, where you, know, you can ask day-to-day -day questions and they can understand uh, uh, what you're looking for because they were asking the same kind of questions. So I think right now you have to kind of seek people out, but we're all available. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. If you have an interest in the profession, we're passionate about it. If you can't tell, uh, we really care about our patients, 
Uh, we care about uh, being able to be the ones that can uh, stand in the moment to make a difference in someone's recovery. Uh, and, and that's what we enjoy doing. So I would say reach out to respiratory therapists, um, reach out to your educational uh, areas uh, that uh, educate and, and uh, produce respiratory therapists would be the best way. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. All right, for Anna, what is the most rewarding aspect of your job? Um, well, in my role um, with Seton, I onboard all of the new respiratory therapy staff. So if you're going to be hired here, I'm the first person from Seton Respiratory that you're going to see and hang out with. Um, so I love that chance to kind of impart like, you know, it's kind of like a baby bird, like the first person they see they're going to imprint on. Like, I want to give anybody who's hired with us kind of that first glimpse of what it's like to work for us, what um, your job entails and how to be successful at it. Um, show you the tools that you need to be successful in your role with us. Um, and that's super rewarding for me because then, you know, it's kind of like after two weeks or three weeks or four weeks or however long your orientation is, I get to release the little baby bird from the nest and you get to go out there and, and do your thing and, and take care of patients. And so um, that's very rewarding for me. Um, in my role as a um, director of clinical education with a respiratory care program, um, it was very much the same kind of thing. I felt a very um, important sense of duty to um, create or to uh, develop students into the type of respiratory therapist that I would want my family member being taken care of when they went to the hospital. So um, yeah, it's, it's very much a sense of duty to kind of create this next generation of um, respiratory therapists that's going to, you know, keep our profession going forward and um, really be there for the patients at the bedside, taking the very best care of them that's possible. Thank you for answering that, Anna. And for our last question here, um, I'm going to ask Isabel. Um, you're working front lines in, in the hospital over there. So what can we do, everyone in the audience, what can we do to protect our respiratory health? So I think just one good rule of thumb in general is to take care of your body overall. Um, exercise, eating healthy, um, definitely keep up with your health. That's important when you're young and it'll pay off as you get old. Um, I think that especially um, right now during this global pandemic, a few things that are very key or to wear your mask um, definitely social distance and um, I know it's so hard especially being young and wanting to hang out with all your friends and do all those fun great things that we used to do before but just right now it's not safe and wearing your mask and staying six feet apart from each other is huge in preventing the spread of this virus um, Plus, um, getting uh, vaccinated once the ability to do so is available to you. Um, I think that this was a huge step in medicine for the nation and the world to come is um, this vaccine. And I think hopefully moving forward, we will see brighter days to come. I was lucky enough to be able to be one of the first few that this vaccine was released to, and I have received both of my doses. Um, it can kind of be scary because it's a new vaccine that's out there, but um, there's been tons and tons of research done on the vaccine, and it has been proven to be very, very safe. Um, personally, the first time I got it, I felt fine. My arm was a little bit sore, but I felt like I felt worse when I got the flu shot. Um, then with my second dose, I felt a little bit more of the side effects, but they were very, very mild. I kind of just felt 
run down and needed a good nap and some Tylenol and then I was ready to go. And I think that is totally worth um, experiencing instead of getting COVID and um, the severe symptoms that can come from that is I firsthand have seen um, and taking care of many, many, many patients with horrible, horrible um, cases of COVID. And it is um, truly um, detrimental to your body and to your health. And just listening to um, what the CDC has to say of wearing your mask, social distance, get your vaccine, that is all huge things. Um, but then also um, taking care of your lungs and um, not smoking, not vaping, and not using those e-cigarettes, that's also huge with lung health also. And um, our lungs are meant to breathe air and oxygen, and they're not meant to breathe these um, manufactured things and um, chemical things that our bodies weren't um, supposed to be ingesting. And um, the earlier you start taking care of your body, the much uh, later in life it will 100% pay off. Thank you, Isabel. All right, um, and thank you to all our panelists for answering all these questions. Um, we're gonna go ahead and switch it on over to Joshua who has a hands-on um, simulation for us. So Joshua, if you'd like to come off mute, um, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, yeah, thanks for everybody for uh, partaking in this. Uh, I'm going to do a little demonstration here, and it, it's it's really super simple. Uh, it's not a a perfect scientific form of doing this, but we're going to measure some lung volumes, and this is something that can easily be rolled out in a high school classroom, or for those of you who are trying to recruit a new respiratory therapist, and maybe if you're visiting high schools, you could do something as simple as this with students to maybe hook them and get them interested in a career in respiratory therapy. All you're going to need is a ruler. Uh, I've got my handy dandy uh, yellow ruler here. Uh, if you have one that's a metric ruler, that's awesome. Uh, you're going to need a balloon. Uh, I've got one. I borrowed this from my two-year-old. She's uh, just fascinated with balloons right now, so I borrowed this from her. Hopefully she doesn't mind. And uh, maybe just a pen and pants, pencil handy would be uh, really great. And Shana, may I ask you to uh, stop sharing your screen? And I'm just going to switch over and share my screen here. Appreciate of course, it. Of course. Thank you. And I just wanted to, for those of you who are non-health professionals, I just wanted to pull up and do just a quick little teach on just different lung volumes. And please, for my respiratory therapist, if you want to chime in and correct me, I, 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 it is a humbling uh, experience for me to be presenting this in front of you because my background's in orthopedics, so that is definitely my comfort zone. But uh, if I say anything wrong, just let me know. We're going to focus on three lung volumes here. When you're doing different types of testing for respiratory volumes, uh, there's all different types of things you can measure. And we're going to focus specifically on tidal volume. We're going to look at vital capacity and then maybe expiratory reserve volume. So we'll look at those three. And just know that uh, tidal volume is is going to be the normal air that you inhale and exhale when you're just breathing. So you're sitting there breathing. If you start to thinking about it, you'll start to probably breathe more and exhale less. Uh, but if you're taking your mind off of it, you'll sink back into sort of a normal rhythm there. And then uh, total lung capacity is going to be as much as you can inhale and then exhale uh, out. And then our vital, or excuse me, our, our vital capacity is that. And then our uh, expiratory reserve volume is going to be the amount that you exhale after a normal exhale. So it's going to be that little bit of extra air that's still left in your lungs to keep you functional. So we're going to focus on those three volumes, but know that there's a lot of ways to kind of look at this and, and measure these things. Now, when looking at uh, our different lung volumes, I'm going to do a very non-scientific approach to this. And Ashley found this uh, activity and it's it's super simple, but uh, the, our balloon is actually going to act as our spirometer. And for those of you in the classroom, uh, there are some great tools out there that uh, uh, Vernier makes that I've used in the classroom as part of my biomedical science classes where students can actually mimic this much better and it's a much cleaner uh, way to collect that data. But we're going to use a balloon. A balloon does have some limitations just because of its elastic elasticity. So you do have to just breathe a little bit harder to, to get it going, but uh, know that it, it will give students at least some sort of an idea of what they are measuring. 
So what we're going to focus on, we're just going to be able to do maybe one trial of uh, maybe two or three of these different lung volumes. And we're going to be using that balloon to uh, exhale some air out and then just see where we're at with some of those measurements. And this is where the balloon and then of course your metric ruler is going to come in handy. Now with that balloon, I would suggest if you do have one handy, just stretching it out, making sure that it does have a little more elasticity and give to it. Uh, but what we're gonna do is um, for our first test here, let's go ahead and measure tidal volume. And as I mentioned, tidal volume is the normal amount of air that you inhale and you exhale, okay? So we're not gonna be pushing that exhale out so far that we're trying to get all the air out of our lungs, but just enough to get that moving. So just to demonstrate, I'm gonna take my balloon here and this balloon's a little bit hard to get going uh, just because it is a little bit tough. Um, the, it's a little too uh, stiff, but uh, I've been kind of working on it for the last hour. And I'm going to just take a normal breath in and then I'm gonna exhale as much as possible. All right, here we go. Okay, well that's about as good as I'm gonna get just because of its elasticity. So what I would do normally in the classroom is I might have the students take a piece of paper to kind of tee off the top of that balloon, but I'm gonna set my balloon down in front of me and I'll just demonstrate on camera here, but I wanna measure from the bottom part of the balloon to the top. So I'm capturing that diameter of the balloon. And you know, just by trying to do that with this balloon, I'm losing a little air as I pinch it, but I hit roughly, I'd say about eight centimeters uh, as I'm looking at that. So we have a little graph here that we can use to, uh, to look at those lung volumes, but let me give you a moment just to try that if you do have a balloon. So try and just take a normal inhale in and then exhale into your balloon, try and pinch it off and then and measure that diameter based on uh, how many centimeters it is. So let me give you all about 30 seconds to do that and try it. I find that it's important as a teacher to be very patient with time. And uh, sometimes there are just awkward pauses, even on Zoom calls. So you just got to go with the flow sometimes. But we got about 20 more seconds now to uh, try that normal inhale and normal exhale for our tidal volume. I wish I would have known to bring a balloon. I would have participated. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, no problem. <laughs> but now you know, you have a, a tool in your tool chest that you can use for later use. <laughs> All right. So as mentioned, uh, if you had a chance to do that, if not, that's okay. Uh, but uh, as mentioned, I hit about 10 centimeters, right? So absolutely not super scientific and perfect, but it, it, it kind of drives home the points of normal inspiration and normal uh, exhalation. But I hit roughly around 10 centimeters doing that and having to kind of bust through the beginning to get that balloon going. Uh, you can see on this graph here, we have an X and Y axis. And this X axis tells you how many uh, how um, the diameter of your balloon in centimeters. So I hit about 10 there if I kind of mark that out and I can kind of track that up onto this curve. And I wish I could have made this curve, but I don't actually know the equation for it and put it on something a little nicer, but this will do. And I can kind of move my cursor up there and that hits at, I don't know, roughly around maybe 800 cubic centimeters. So on my Y axis, I've got my lung volume, which is measured in cubic centimeters. And if I go down, I, I probably pushed a little too hard because it looks like my average lung volume was a little higher than normal. But on average for me as a male, it'd be about 525 cubic centimeters. So I think I pushed a little too hard. And that's uh, just part of trying to get that balloon to work um, a little bit more. Uh, so that was tidal volume. Uh, let's try one more. Let's try vital capacity. I think this is the easiest one to do with a balloon. And um, if you're interested, I'm sure uh, Shannon can push this out to the group. Uh, Ashley has a copy of this, and I'm also happy to send a copy of this to you as well, Shannon, so that uh, any of you can use with uh, K through 12 students. So let's try our, uh, our vital capacity. And remember, our vital capacity is gonna be where I inhale as much as I can, and then I exhale all that air out. And please, if you have any medical conditions where you might have a problem with increasing too much pressure inside of your body, please don't exhale too hard because that could potentially uh, cause some other complications. So I encourage you to do what is comfortable in this case. Our, our students have, uh, they're probably, their systems are a little more pliable than ours as we get older. So uh, they can probably push a little bit harder than some of us. But what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna take that deep breath in. I'm gonna exhale as much as possible. And then I'm gonna give you a chance 
chance to do that and I'll measure mine and kind of demonstrate it. So let me try this. I'm gonna go inhale. Boy, that balloon is hard to blow up. All right, so if I pass out here, that's my, uh, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> try and keep myself going as much as possible but I've got my balloon here and if I do my very unscientific measurement holding it up in the air for you I would say that maybe that diameter hit around oh, I'm gonna say about 21 centimeters so let me give you all 30 seconds to try that out yourself taking a very deep breath in taking as much as you can exhale as much as possible and uh, see if you can measure that using the centimeter side of your ruler. So I'm going to pause here, give you a chance to try that. And we got about 10 more seconds. So as mentioned, uh, my very unofficial measurements was about 20 centimeters, which if I track that line up across my, my curve, uh, I can see that I hit roughly around 4,000 cubic centimeters, uh, which is actually um, probably a little less than where it should be, but once again, I was really having to push against that balloon and it sort of hit its capacity there at the end. And I was really trying not to pass out on you too while we're on camera at the same time. So uh, that is my un very unofficial experiment for you all. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, definitely Workforce Solutions can push this out. And uh, for my respiratory therapist, if you need to contact me and say, hey, what was wrong with you? Why did you say that incorrect? Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up from Dr. Marshall. So I, I imagine I did okay. <laughs> and, and thank you to our panelists and to Josh for being here today with us. I loved the conversation and it was, obvious that you all have a very high passion for respiratory therapy. So we obviously picked the best panelists because you guys were very inspiring. And I hope a lot of the students who I know are on today enjoyed the conversation as well. So like Shannon reiterated, like if you need any resources on respiratory therapy, please reach out. We do have them um, as well as Jenna and Dr. Marshall with their programs here locally. Um, I did want to give everyone just a quick update about clinical placements. Obviously with the spike that we had in COVID recently, we will not be doing spring clinical placements for high school students. We are hopeful that this next fall, we will be able to open those back up as the vaccinations get distributed more evenly and we can start getting students vaccinated as well, then we can go ahead and restart those in the process. And uh, there wasn't much update because the hospitals were really hopeful that we needed to take an assessment in January, hoping that we could allow students back in. And unfortunately, due to the spike, that just wasn't possible. So that's my major update that I had. But if anybody has anything else that they need resources for, Shannon, the other career specialist, Leslie and I are all here to serve you guys at Workforce Solutions. So please keep in touch. Let us know what we can do to help. And we will be doing these type of speaker panel discussions on a monthly basis from now on. So I believe next month, Shannon, correct me if I'm wrong, but we decided to go to surgical tech as our next um, area of interest. So funny story, it was supposed to be our March <laughs> of 2020 activity, but due to COVID, it got canceled. So we will be starting that back up. So if you guys find these of value or if there's additional questions you would like us to ask panelists, please let us know in advance. We're happy to work those in.